Here's a headline from today's New York Times. Digitized data of five million Bulgarians is stolen in hack. Perhaps you also recall the hack of Equifax that exposed 140 million social security numbers, or the Chinese hack of 21.5 million records from the US Office of Personnel Management. 500 million clients had their information stolen from the Marriott Corporation, one billion from Yahoo, not to mention the ransoming of the British healthcare system, skewed elections from the Ukraine to the US, and the shutdown of municipalities across this country, including a malware attack on the Philadelphia court system. So who are you gonna call? We called the veteran counterterrorism ter czar and leading expert on cybersecurity, Richard Clark. Clark has worked for seven presidents and devoted three decades of his professional life to combating threats to the United States. He is the author of four novels and four nonfiction books, including the New York Times bestseller, Against All Enemies, Inside America's War on Terror. He'll be joined tonight by his co-author, Robert Kanaki, Director for Cybersecurity Policy at the NSC under President Obama from 2011 to 2015. He is currently a senior fellow with the Council on Foreign Relations and senior research scientist at Northeastern University's Global Resilience Institute. In their latest book, The Fifth Domain, the authors detail cyber attacks, web warriors, and weapons fighting on the front lines of today's incursions and the ways that governments, businesses, and citizens can confront such threats. They'll be interviewed tonight by Michael Smirkanish, host of the Michael Smirkanish program on Sirius XM POTUS channel 124 and host of CNN's Smirkanish on Saturday mornings. Michael is also a New York Times bestselling author. I'm sure many of you have seen him here over the years. Please welcome Richard Clark, Robert Kanaki, and Michael Smirkanish to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Thank you, good evening. So gentlemen, in 2010, you wrote a best-selling book called Cyber War. You can thump your chest and take credit for the things that you anticipated but you also have to tell us what you didn't see coming. Well, let me take that one. I, I'll say that the, the most surprising thing to us that we didn't see coming was the fact that we think cybersecurity actually got better in the last 10 years. Nobody thought that was going to happen. We were predicting war, we were predicting chaos, we were predicting hell in cyberspace. And what we've seen, particularly in the last five years, is companies are actually starting to figure out how to solve this problem. Dick, you want to add to that at all? Yeah, I think Rob's uh, exactly right. You know, 10 years ago, we wrote Cyber War. We said no company can defend itself against a nation state adversary. So if the Russian GRU or the Chinese People's Liberation Army wants to get into your company, no matter who you are, a big bank, whatever, they can get in. We said that 10 years ago. It was true 10 years ago. It's not true now. Um, there are lots of companies um, that are the dogs that don't bark. You, know? you hear about Equifax and Marriott and Target and Yahoo and shall I keep going? Um, but there's also a list that's pretty long of companies that you've never heard having been hacked and they're just as juicy a target. And the reason you haven't heard about them being hacked is they haven't been hacked in the last five years because the technology to defend yourself is out there. Um, you just have to buy it, and it's really expensive. JP Morgan, one bank, uh, told us that they spend $700 million a year, every year. Uh, we, heard, we just heard the other night, uh, we tried when we were writing the book to find out how much Bank of America spent uh, every year, and they wouldn't tell us, but we finally found out after the book came out. Uh, they spend $1.2 billion a year defending their network. So, yes, you can do it. That's the news. Uh, it costs a lot. You say in the book and explain how the balance of power between offense and defense has shifted and that defense is now much better than it had been previously. Why? So... We talk a lot about technology and how the banks are spending billions of dollars on technology, but probably the biggest innovation over the last decade has really been conceptual. 
And it's been this idea, if, if you talk to a CISO in 2008, they'd say cybersecurity is impossible. There's no way I could defend my bank. Why can't I defend my bank? Well, I've got 400,000 endpoints, 400,000 computers that I've got to protect. And the adversary only needs to get into one. They win, I lose. The odds are against me. Well, the Defense Department and Lockheed Martin and other uh, big defense contractors, they started to reverse that logic around 2008, 2009, and they said, well, the adversary's goal isn't to get into the network, it's to get onto the network and then move across it and find the data they want and steal it or destroy it or disrupt our operations. So we don't actually have to stop them from getting in our network, we have to stop them from achieving their objective. And we can do that many, many times in many different ways. So they've gotta be perfect. We can mess up nine out of 10 times as long as we catch them once. It is harder for them to achieve their goal than it is for us to achieve ours. And despite the reasons for optimism, both of you still believe that the next war will be initiated by a cyber attack. How might that unfold? Well, we saw a, a slight example of that last month. Uh, Hamas, the uh, terrorist group that runs uh, the Gaza Strip, uh, was attacking Israel uh, in cyberspace. Uh, and that shows you, by the way, how easy it is, uh, how low the barrier is. Um, the terrorist groups are doing this. Um, and the Israelis are very good at cyber defense, but they also have kind of a low burn, you know. Uh, they, they don't take it very much. Uh, so they said, you know, rather than just fighting these Hamas attacks on our network every day, we're just going to blow them up. <laughs> so they launched a couple of F-16s, and they knew the building that Hamas had its cyber center in, and they blew it up. Um, that's, I use that as a, as a metaphor, um, because I think that's what's going to happen. There are going to be cyber attacks in cyberspace, and, and they're going to get so painful that somebody is going to say, to hell with it, you know, let's go uh, into a conventional war. Uh, the Pentagon actually has said that. The Pentagon's public policy on this stuff, which you can go read uh, on their website, uh, is if we get hacked, we the United States, not just the Pentagon, but if the United States gets hacked by a nation state in a really damaging way, which they don't define, you know, intentional ambiguity, uh, we reserve the right to go after whoever did it with missiles and bombs. So, you know, I, I think some people think cyber war is safe. You know, Trump, for example, said uh, when the Iranians shot down our drone recently, <coughs> uh, the generals recommended we bomb them, but I didn't want to kill people. Um, so, and they told me I would kill 150 people if I did what they wanted with the bombs. So, I just launched a cyber attack. People think it's safer. It's not, because it'll eventually slip uh, into a regular war. So you reference nation state. What I know from reading the fifth domain is that we face threats from nation states. We face these type of threats from individuals. We face these type of threats from clubs that I didn't know existed. What's the, the single most significant threat on the horizon? And if it's a country, name the country. So, I mean, the real danger is that you're going to match geopolitical circumstances with a cyber offensive capability. So right now, it's more likely that we will get into a cyber war with Iran than with any other country. I'd follow that up with Russia. We also don't really know where relations are heading with China and the United States. What we've seen with Trump's trade war is that China has ramped up their economic espionage again. They leveled that off. They may have even stopped doing it for a couple of years due to an agreement that we did in the Obama administration, uh, but now they're back on, so. And the thing is, Iran has already attacked us, uh, and we've already attacked them. Um, so we, the United States, attacked their nuclear centrifuges with a cyber attack. We took physical objects in the real world, and using a cyber attack, we blew them up. Uh, they came back and uh, knocked all our major banks offline for a few days. So you couldn't do online banking with Citigroup or, or, or Bank of America. And, you know, and Trump just fired some cyber shots at them. We're firing cyber shots all the time. They are. The Russians are firing cyber shots. 
we apparently are in their power grid, they're apparently in our power grid, according to the U.S. government. And we're not, when you read this book, you know, there are some things that will surprise you. That's why this time we have footnotes. <laughs> because we're not making this stuff up. We don't have to. Uh, you know, the head of U.S. intelligence, openly, publicly, in a hearing, said the Russians are in the controls of our power grid, the Chinese are in the controls of our natural gas pipelines. So something that distinguishes what you refer to, and it's the book title as the fifth domain, is that responsibility for protecting us against this cyber threat lies not with the government, not with the federal government solely, but with this shared responsibility between the private sector and the government. And I was surprised as I read it that you placed the lion's share of responsibility on the private sector. Why? That seems odd. Aren't I paying tax dollars to be defended against this? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we quote, I think we quote Ben Affleck in, in, the, uh, in the book on this. As Noted Tony. cyber expert Ben Affleck. <laughs> Uh, ben Affleck is as Tony Mendez, uh, who was a CIA operative who uh, ran the Argo operation that got the uh, hostages out of Iran during the Iran uh, crisis, right? And uh, if you've seen the movie or read the book, right, the, the story goes that uh, Menendez comes in, he comes up with this idea, he says, okay, I'm going to fly into Tehran, into the airport, I'm going to pretend I'm on a movie crew, I'm going to find these hostages, these guys who are hiding out, who hadn't been captured yet, I'm gonna take them, dress them up like movie stars, and I'm gonna walk them back into the Tehran airport past the Islamic Revolutionary Guard, and I'm then going to fly them to Switzerland. And he briefs this idea to Stansfield Turner, I think, who was the uh, CIA director at the time. And in the movie, but I think this is probably true, you know, he says, well, this idea is crazy. And Affleck says, well, Yes, sir, but it's the best option we've got. And Turner says, you don't have any other better bad ideas than this one, right? This is the nature of all policy. This is how Washington works. It's always about what's the least bad option, what's the best bad idea you've got. And so you know, when you look at, at cyberspace, the idea of saying to private companies, you have to protect yourselves from the Russians and the Chinese, from nation state actors who are coming after you, not because they're criminals, not because they want your money, but because you represent American power, because you can harm the geopolitical interest of the United States. That sounds nuts. The problem is there is no other option. Because Jamie Dimon may not like the idea that he has to spend a billion dollars a year protecting JP Morgan, but what he really wouldn't like is the idea of having the NSA or Cyber Command sit on his network decide which bank transactions he's gonna to allow to pass, what emails are gonna go through, make decisions about how his bank operates. That would be worse to him than having to spend a billion dollars a year protecting his own network. And, and by the way, what makes you think that the government could do a good job? <laughs> it doesn't do a good job on a lot of things. Um, <clears throat> and it, it doesn't do a good job on defending its own networks. It doesn't do a good job on defending its own code software in its own weapon systems. So I think you're right. Jamie Dimon, the head of you know, J.P. Morgan Bank, is not going to say, oh, let's, let's bring in the pros from Dover, the army. Um, I don't think so. I guess one of the reactions I had when I read that discussion in the book is to think that at least when the government is in charge, that sounds a bit ominous, but when the government's in charge, the, the, the left hand knows what the right hand is doing. <laughs> Can... <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> but when we're relying on the private sector, how do we know? It, it seems to me that it's, it's, it's embarrassing if it's a bank, if it's some financial entity and they've been hacked, for that to be in the public domain because now there's a loss of confidence. What I'm getting at is, can they be trusted to disclose when in fact they've been the victim of an attack? No, I mean, I think that's, that's the straight answer, right? In certain sectors, if it's health insurance and patient records are lost, that gets disclosed. If under new rules, it's a hack into the power company, that should get disclosed. If it has an impact on a major corporation that is publicly listed, they are supposed to disclose, but they don't always. What we've seen though, and the incident that we talk about in the book, uh, is now that you're seeing these disruptive, destructive attacks, 
you really can't hide that. When the production line for making Oreos gets shut down by malware and there are no Oreos on shelves in Walmart, you can't hide that. And so we're starting to be able to see which companies have good cybersecurity and which companies don't because of this kind of activity. I, and Oreos didn't. I, I told you both before we came out here that I, I was reading in, reading the book uh, coincidentally last Saturday when a portion of the grid went out in New York City, not believed to be terror, but there's a whole discussion. Are, are you convinced that, that it was, was not, or, or are not sure? You know, Michael, when I used to do terrorism, Al-Qaeda, and, and any time anything blew up, uh, an FBI agent would run in front of a microphone and say two mutually contradictory things. That wasn't terrorism. We don't know what it was. Um, and that's kind of what we heard out of Con Ed in New York. It was like, that wasn't a cyber attack. We have no idea why this happened. Um, they're still investigating. I don't, I'm not saying it was. Um, but you're right, there's a whole chapter in the book about how vulnerable the power grid is. And we know the Russians uh, have already done this because they went into Ukraine twice and shut the lights out. Uh, and what's interesting is, according to the experts we talked to for writing the book, when the Russians were in the Ukrainian control system, they could have destroyed, physically destroyed, the transformers and the generators, and they didn't. And some of the people we talked to said, because we think that was a trial run that they were doing, and a trial run for guess who. Um, so it could be much worse, because you're used to, every once in a while, there's a hurricane or a big wind or something, and, and the lights go out. And the worst case is a couple of days later, they come back. But if you destroy the transformers, you destroy the generators, it's not a few weeks, it's a few months. Is it the electric grid? If you look at the different sectors of vulnerability, healthcare, financial markets, electricity, is it, is it the electrical grid that should worry us all the most? Yeah, I mean, well, what undergrids every other critical infrastructure? So government defines 16 or 18, depending on how you count, critical infrastructure sectors. Each one of them is dependent on electricity. If they don't have electricity, you're not going to have water, you're not going to have sewer, you're not going to have banking and finance, you may not have ambulance services. So from that perspective, you take out the power, you shut down modern society. A, a naive question, a very basic question. The cloud, the development of the cloud, whatever that means, does it make us more or less vulnerable? So I mean, in the book, we, we kind of go all in on cloud. Uh, and, and the reason for that is for most individuals, for most businesses, you are so much better off being in the loving embrace of Amazon or Google or Oracle or Microsoft than you are trying to roll your own. They have thousands of people working to defend their networks and defend your data. You don't, you can't afford it go in on the cloud. So for the vast majority of cases, it's gonna make sense to go into the cloud. Now, if you're the US government and you're trying to protect top secret information, you're gonna roll your own cloud. You're gonna create your own multi-tenancy uh, situation so that government agencies can go there. And you're gonna to wanna to control everything from the hardware on up because you know that the Russians will try and compromise that. But for almost every other circumstance, you're gonna be better off in the cloud. I was surprised to learn that despite all the sophistication, most attacks still begin with what's referred to as spear phishing, which to me puts John Podesta and his risotto recipe on the brain. But there's a lesson in that for all of us, right? Yeah, I think at the personal level, the lesson, I mean, if you really wanna be paranoid, you really wanna be safe, the lesson is don't click on anything in an email. You get an email from, you know, Michael Smirkanish at Yahoo. He, you don't have a Yahoo account. No. So you can go on Yahoo now and register an account, Michael Smirkanish oh, at Yahoo. Oh, thanks for that. Thank you for that. <clears throat> perfect. And you get, you get an email from a friend, but it's from an account that your friend doesn't have. Right. Uh, and there's a, you know, attached is a great picture of, you know, whatever. Uh, or, I love this news story. Click this link. Don't click links, 
don't open up, don't open up, uh, don't open up attachments. Uh, and if you have any doubt in your mind, do something really old-fashioned. Call the person who sent it to you on the telephone and say, Michael, do you have a Yahoo account? We have internet open borders. Is that in our best interest? So we have a whole chapter in the book that when we uh, went out to uh, syndicate it, they made us rewrite because nobody liked the title, A Schengen Accord for the Internet. <laughs> Does that mean anything to anybody in the room? Does anybody travel in Europe? Okay, so the Schengen Accord... So that, that was three people. Three so, people. So that we and should, my we should have changed, we should have changed the have time. been to Italy every year for the last three years. So they benefited from this, right? The Schengen Accord is the accord that allows somebody in Spain to drive to Germany without having to stop at each of the national borders along the way. So it's sort of an external passport and visa control. Once you're into the Schengen area, you're in. You don't get stopped, you don't get checked again. And so this is the idea that we think we need to evolve to in cyberspace. Instead of just saying, okay, we're gonna have an open internet and anybody can join it and anybody can reap the benefits of it, we need to say, okay, here are the rules that Western countries are gonna play by. And India, Brazil, we really want you to play by them too. And Russia, China, you're not playing by them, and we're gonna to start to find ways to exclude you. Those ways probably don't look like physical barriers. We're not talking about building a cyber wall like Seth Moulton suggested. That doesn't make any sense. That's not how the technology works. That would be privacy invasive. It would disrupt business. But we are talking about digital trade barriers. We're talking about doing things like shutting down bulletproof hosting companies in Russia. These are companies that host child pornography, that will host uh, attack infrastructure, and will never respond to a request to take down by law enforcement. We are talking about doing things like dropping them off the rest of the internet. So that might be where we want to get. Yeah, get the, the good nations that are not scofflaws, uh, get a group of like-minded nations together, agree on some rules of the road, uh, and make things easier for them and harder for everybody else. Assume that a multinational corporation calls either of you and says, we've been hacked, they've encrypted our data, and they're charging us a ransom. Are you advising to pay? We have different Depends answers. on who you call. <laughs> <laughs> I get that call a lot, and um, I say, do you have a backup? And how far back does it go? And the answer I usually get is, yeah, we've got a backup. It's backed up for 72 hours or something. <laughs> well, bring the backup down only if you're sure that it doesn't have the ransomware too. Otherwise, when you bring your, your only backup down and put it online, it's going to be encrypted too, and you're not even going to have that. So if you're not sure that your backup is safe, pay up. And they say, oh, can we trust these, these bad guys who encrypted our network? Uh, the answer is yes. And the reason the answer is yes is they have their reputation to defend. Now, you think about that. No one is ever going to pay if the word gets around that when your network is encrypted uh, and they demand money for you to get the key to reopen your own network. If they don't do that when people pay, no one's ever going to pay again. So they're really pretty good. Uh, if you pay, you get your network back and they won't do it to you again. Now, I know that's giving money to bad guys. Uh, and that's why he disagrees. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the danger here is you give this money to the Ukrainian or Bulgarian or Russian cyber criminals. They take two thirds of it, they spend it on Lamborghinis and leather jackets. Then they take one third of it and they reinvest like any other business. And they invest in attack tools and capabilities and they're finding their own zero day vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities that nobody else has discovered before, completely unknown and they're setting up testing labs so they can defeat even the most advanced uh, anti-malware technologies on the market. And every year they're getting better because we're giving them the funding 
were their sort of VC branch. When Riviera Beach in Florida pays, they're essentially funding a growing criminal capability. And so from that reason, I, you know, my argument for a long time has been it should be illegal to pay ransom. If you made it illegal to pay ransom, people would start investing in their own cybersecurity. But one last thought on, on this ransomware business, where they, they get into your network and they encrypt everything and you can't use your own network. It reveal, the, the people who get hacked that way reveal to us the people who are not doing a good job on their own security. So I hate to say it, but Baltimore, city government, Atlanta, city government, um, the fact that you got hacked successfully uh, and everything got encrypted tells us you weren't doing enough to protect your own network. You know, I don't know about Philadelphia, but I haven't heard about them being hacked this way yet. I got to tell you, if Atlanta and Baltimore, if they tried Atlanta and Baltimore, they tried Philadelphia. Philadelphia, not encrypted, probably doing a better job. You say that 2016 was our cyber Pearl Harbor. Are we ready for 2020? No. Um, look, what happened in, in 2016 was an attack on the most fundamental part of our country, our democracy, the mechanisms of our democracy. And it was an attack by the Russian army. Um, and we know that, there's no doubt about that. Um, what have we done to prevent them from doing it again? Not much. Um, what, what did they do? They did a couple of things, three things. They hacked their way into candidates. You mentioned John Podesta, who was Hillary's campaign manager. They hacked their way into campaigns, stole emails, and then published them in embarrassing ways. First thing. Campaigns are still vulnerable. Second thing, they used social media and they targeted specific precincts. So, for example, they went after West Philadelphia and they pretended to be African Americans and they shot social media at people in West Philadelphia saying, you know, Hillary doesn't believe Black Lives Matter, don't vote for Hillary. Hillary, you know, made money on helping Haiti. Uh, she's just trying to rip off black people. Don't vote for Hillary. They targeted very specific precincts in, in Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, and they made it look like they were us. Facebook and Google and all those, you know, Twitter have hired thousands of people and are spending millions of dollars trying to identify these fake accounts, and as soon as they take them down, new ones pop up. They're still going to be able to do that stuff. Uh, and finally, they hacked their way into the databases of, of the election commissions in 39 states. Now, I don't know what they did when they got into those databases. I don't know if they got into election machines or not. And the reason I don't know is that nobody knows. And after the election, the election commissioners in all the states and all the counties, there are 4,000 counties, the election commissioners said, we did not detect any Russian attacks. And my question would have been, and do you have detection equipment? <laughs> because the answer would have been no. Uh, none of them had sophisticated uh, detection equipment, and so they didn't know, and they still don't know. They still don't have uh, sophisticated detection equipment because they can't afford it. And therefore, we're talking about a federal election of a president. Um, the Constitution, help me here, Michael, because you're, you're the lawyer. Um, the Constitution says uh, that the states will run the elections. But I think it then says, but, which is kind of a rare word in the Constitution, um, but the Congress may provide rules for the elections of federal officials. I just don't think it's a crazy idea for the federal government to set minimum security standards for federal elections. And then, if the states and counties say, but I can't afford to do that, give them the money. Why haven't we given them the money? Because the Republican leadership in the United States Senate refuses to pass a bill that has already passed the House that would give the states the money so they could protect themselves against the Russians. That causes some of us to ask, why do the Republicans in the Senate not want to protect us from the Russians? 
something that I learned from the book, and Rob, I want you to speak to the, the 2016 election, lessons learned and, and not learned, but something that you put in my head is that in the book you discuss how election machine manufacturers are very few. Most of the machines come from a, a handful of places and that they're under no obligation to share their software with the government so that we can make sure that they are protected against the type of cyber attack. Th that would seem like a very tangible thing that the Congress ought to mandate. Yeah, and I mean, so there are some questions here about how good we are at finding vulnerabilities. How well can we detect a problem in source code when it's provided? But we're not doing it at all. And so we really don't know whether we can trust Diebold. We don't know if they're better than, say, Huawei at writing secure code. And so from that perspective, we don't have faith that something that needs to be fundamentally sound is fundamentally sound. We have that kind of understanding, at least at some level, for our weapon systems that protect our democracy, but we don't have it for the machine of our democracy. What most surprised either of you about what went on in 2016? What, what is it perhaps that the public doesn't appreciate that transpired? Well, it turns out the Obama administration saw a lot of what was going on. Um, and it didn't, it didn't, in retrospect, understand the extent of the micro-targeting of social media. Uh, no one did. That information came out much later after the election. But the Obama administration did see the, the Russians doing things to affect the election. Uh, and the head of CIA called his Russian counterpart and said, we see you doing it, knock it off. Um, the president um, sent a team up to meet with the leadership of the Congress uh, to try to get bipartisan agreement to issue a bipartisan statement during the campaign saying the Russians are trying to affect our election, knock it off. And the Republican leadership in the Senate would not go along. I didn't know any of that at the time. And, and the concern, Rob, I guess from the president at the time, President Obama, was that if he spoke up more about it, it would have been perceived as his attempt at election interference. Yeah, I think, I think that there was a strong belief that that would be something that would not behoove the president to do, uh, as well as, I think, a belief that Hillary Clinton had this locked up. And so given the polls, it was looking a little dicey. Why get involved on that level? It's probably not going to matter. You don't want to give Trump something that he can hit Hillary over the head with. He had enough ammunition already. And so I think from that perspective, it was the wrong calculation. Are our hands clean in this regard? The United States government, whether it's election interference or cyber attacks, the types that you write about in the book? We, to the best of my knowledge, um, uh, we have never tried to manipulate an election in Russia. Um, have we historically tried to manipulate elections elsewhere? Um, yeah. Um, uh, after World War II, we tried to manipulate the outcome of elections in Greece, in Italy, uh, trying to prevent the communists from taking over, uh, and we succeeded. Um, but we have not, in modern history, uh, in recent history, uh, tried to get into Russia, uh, which is allegedly a democracy and allegedly have elections, uh, and tried to affect their outcome. I'd say that the the piece of this that is really complicated uh, for a lot of uh, foreigners to understand is that after the Snowden revelations, uh, after the Manning revelations, it really looked like the story was shaped to suggest that the US intelligence community was everywhere. It was into ev everything. It had far better capability than other countries did. And there's a degree to which that was true of capabilities. But what it also showed was that we had surprisingly clean hands. That if you went and read the State Department cables that were publicly released by Chelsea Manning, it actually made our State Department officials look pretty good, pretty professional, like they understood the issues, like they were working on the right side. And it didn't reveal election interference anywhere around the world. And the same thing with the Snowden revelations. We've seen actually inside the 
capability that was supposed to be kept secret. We've seen what the US government was capable of doing, and we've seen what it did. And so it actually shows we're pretty restrained in our use. We're fairly targeted compared to what the Russians or the Chinese are doing particularly if you look at the issue of economic espionage, it was US government policy for, since the 1950s that the US intelligence community would not spy on behalf of US companies and share foreign trade secrets, business information, patents with US companies. That was policy since the 1950s. We only made that policy publicly known after the Snowden revelations when we were trying to get China to change their behavior. We had a lot of evidence, we still do, that China is spying on US companies for the benefit of their national champions. We're not doing that. I'm not quite sure how to say the name of the Chinese company. Huawei, Huawei? Huawei. Yeah. How integrated is Huawei in the US cyber infrastructure? Is that a danger, and what do you think we should do about it? So Huawei is a Chinese company that makes um, switches and routers that support telephone networks and internet networks. Um, they're a decent product. They are about 25% of the cost of similar products made elsewhere. Uh, and the administration, the Trump administration, is trying to ban them from the United States. Uh, I want to ask all of you to promise me something that you will not quote what I'm about to say, <laughs> and Michael will not put it on the radio show, the Trump administration is right. Um, there, I said it. It's the only time I'll ever agree with them on anything. Um, not because Huawei has a back door in any of its software today, it might, uh, but because under Chinese law, any Chinese company must do what the Chinese intelligence agencies ask them to do. That's a law. Uh, they published it, so we know it exists. Um, so if, if we had Huawei transmitters for our new 5G networks that are going up, uh, they get software updates all the time, you know, just like your uh, laptop does, just like your iPhone does. Uh, and one day, it's possible that if, if Huawei was ordered to, there could be a software update that would put a back door uh, in that 5G network. So the Chinese intelligence agency could listen to everything on it or shut it off when they want to. Um, so, yeah, I don't want our 5G network built by Huawei. Um, when you look around for an American company that can do it, there isn't one, which is kind of disappointing. Uh, but there are European companies that we can buy from. So far, Huawei has done very little penetration of the U.S. market. It's all over the rest of the world because it's cheap. So uh, I know like, there's a lot of seediness in the dark web, uh, but I've also heard that you know, there are some things in there as kind of an incubator or experimental kind of petri dish for other things to come out of uh, that, that some companies and so forth might be co-opting uh, you know, to... You know, maybe solve some of the problems that you've been talking about. So is that true, or what, what kinds of lessons or things from the dark web might end up being part of everyone's kind of regular lives? So the, the dark web, I'm going to do a terrible job explaining this, but I'll try. The, the dark web is essentially running over the internet a separate and secure system that prizes anonymity above everything else. And so the idea is you go in through one entry point, and then your traffic is moved around to other routers so that nobody can figure out who you are or where you're from. And it was originally developed by the US government for, as a technology, to circumvent censorship in places like China and Russia. It's since been co-opted as a technology by criminal groups and criminal gangs. So it's a hard thing to say right now what the real value is that we get out of this. The, the Chinese are on to the technology and they've gotten pretty darn good at blocking uh, access to the dark web as a circumvention tool for censorship. Uh, the Russians, on the other hand, can't even block basic apps at this point, like Telegram, when they try to. So from that perspective, I, I don't know that we necessarily need 
the dark web as some kind of way to get around censorship any longer. Uh, but it was, it was a very interesting idea. It's a, little, it's a little frightening when you're talking about the cost of cybersecurity. And I'm wondering what you would recommend uh, to municipalities or cities like Philadelphia where they can't even afford librarians in their public elementary schools, or the government, how are they going to get, what, what could they do to get the biggest bang for their buck? Uh, don't try to do it themselves. As Rob said earlier, we're big advocates of the cloud uh, and something called managed security providers, uh, security as a service. Uh, so if I were the mayor of Philadelphia, thank God I'm not because it's a tough job. Um, if I were mayor of Philadelphia, I would look at outsourcing as much of the running of the network and the running of the security of the network, outsource it as much as possible uh, with a competitive bid. Uh, you know, there are a number of companies that would love that contract and are pretty good. Uh, and I don't know, maybe that is what, I don't know Philadelphia well enough anymore. I used to go to school here, but I haven't lived here in years. Uh, maybe that is what they do. And maybe that's why they haven't been hacked. You know, I think the basic point, just to pile on here, is that if you think of all the value that businesses and governments and individuals get from information technology, get from the internet, get from having a computer in your phone that is more powerful than what powered the uh, Apollo landings, if you think of the value you get from that and how much money it saves you and the efficiency, all we're asking, what we're pleading for, is to plow a small percentage of those savings back into securing this infrastructure and this information. We think it's worth it. We think the way to do it for businesses is through some kind of regulatory construct where we make them value that information. And if they value that information and they have to protect that information, they'll make the investments. Yeah. And, and when we say Bank of America spends a billion dollars a year securing its network, that sounds like a lot of money. It's not when you're Bank of America. You also argue in the book that there are too many cybersecurity businesses, firms out there, and that the industry needs a consolidation. What, what can be done independent of just market forces thinning the herd? You did read the book. Um, <laughs> I think market forces. Um, so it turns out if you have a bright idea for a cybersecurity product, there are lots of venture capital firms uh, in Boston, New York, and in San Francisco, who will throw money at you. Uh, and uh, the result of that, uh, it, the reason for that, by the way, is that some cybersecurity companies have made a lot of money. Uh, we talk in the book to uh, the CTO, chief technology officer, of a company called CrowdStrike. And he, he's a friend, and, and he's a great uh, raconteur, and we have great stories from him. Uh, and then after we wrote the book, he took his company to the New York Stock Exchange in, a, in an initial public offering, and on the first day, it was valued at $13 billion. So next time, he's buying drinks. But um, <laughs> So because of this phenomenon, um, there are a lot of cyber companies, and they tend to solve one little problem. They're kind of one-note ponies, uh, one-trick ponies. Uh, and when you look at a big uh, corporation, they don't have one cyber security product. They have 50 or 60. We found one that had 70. 70 different cyber security products, all designed to go after one little type of attack. Um, that's not sustainable. Uh, those aren't companies, they're features. Uh, and slowly the market will kill off the companies that aren't doing anything exciting, uh, and other bigger companies will buy the little ones, uh, and you'll end up with a smaller number of companies. But it, right now it's good because it, it spurs innovation. So we've used uh, ex as examples Bank of America and JP Morgan spending lots of money. Is there any uh, exchange of information between institutions like that so that there's a kind of uh, building knowledge about the nature of attacks? And what, what would be the advantage of that if that existed? So, I mean, it's a great question. And the answer is there's a huge advantage in it because 
if you detect an attack once, you detect the infrastructure, you detect the technology, and then you share that with everybody else in your community, you start to create herd immunity. You start to make it so you're making the attacker have to work so much harder. Then the attacker has to use new infrastructure, a new vulnerability, a new payload, a new email message for every company they want to attack. Financial industry is the best of any industry at sharing this kind of information. They have something called the uh, Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis Center, the FSISAC. State of the art, world class, rivals what the US government is doing on information sharing. What they're pressing for now is to improve information sharing with the US government. They want to get piped in intelligence directly from the US intelligence community. They want to be able to have classified access the same way that, say, a US uh, government agency does. And they want to be brought into that intelligence cycle. So that's the next step of where we're going. But, but you're right. If, if Bank of America detects a new kind of attack, Citibank knows about that within minutes. One of the things that I know you mentioned at the end of the book are things that people can do individually to protect themselves uh, about various you know, phishing attacks, et cetera, and encrypting their, you know, 500 word uh, passwords and so forth and uh, to protect ourselves. But it seems to me also in what you're suggesting with that is that the greatest vulnerability that we have are individuals themselves in terms of getting into the systems. And whether that's true in the public domain um, for people who work in government or work in the cities or work into uh, as publicly elected officials even. Um, how do you suggest, and, and, and I, I guess I have to go back, I, I keep seeing a vision in my mind going back to the movie Patton, where there's a German officer uh, who's always up on the board putting up various different things about Patton as they're looking at that. And it would seem logical that from a GRU perspective or a Chinese perspective or even Al Qaeda perspective, of looking at individuals through the United States who are decision makers and tracking their individual activities and tracking their financial capabilities. Why is it that we haven't seen that so far in terms of the attacks potentially on individuals? We have. You're, you're exactly right. Um, so you may remember the federal government had a, an HR department uh, called the Office of Personnel Management. Uh, and it was that small organization that, that housed all the security clearance information. Now, if you've never had a, a top secret security clearance, let me tell you, uh, it's a bit like a proctology exam. Um, and they, they talk to your high school teacher, your, your high school sweetheart, they talk to the, the people next door, they talk, they, and they look at all your bank accounts, and uh, so they know more about you than you know about yourself. All of that information for two million people got stolen by China. So the Chinese now know more about me and Rob than we know about ourselves. Um, when Marriott got hacked, I was like, why is the Chinese government hacking Marriott? And then I realized that Marriott has a picture of your passport if you've gone to a Marriott outside of the country. Now, let's put all this together. By the way, some of the attacks on the healthcare companies were also by the Chinese army. You put this all together, there is that room with the, with the guy with the pins and the pictures. And I can no longer, not that I ever did, uh, but I can no longer show up in a country and pretend that I'm Michael Smirkanish. Um, because they've got my picture. They've got my DNA record. They know everything about me. Uh, and so if the, if the CIA wants to put somebody undercover with a, with a phony name, the Chinese can know that now because they've got all the data on everybody, whoever had the security clearance, including their picture and all the information about them. Uh, so you know, if you're not going to be a secret agent, it may not matter and not many people are secret agents. Let me just a ask a quick survey question here. When you talk about attacks on you and the individual, how many of you have been told that your credit card was hacked and it had to be replaced? 
That's almost the entire audience saying yes. Now, how many of you had to pay for the thing that the criminals bought with your credit card? No hands went up. So what that says is, yeah, you're at risk a little when you lose your credit card, but you're not out money. So far, the banks and the credit card companies make good the loss because they can afford to, given all the other money they're making. Uh, the real inconvenience for individuals being attacked uh, is that you um, may lose privacy data uh, and it may take you um, a lot of time to clear up your identity theft uh, online, but you're probably not going to lose money. Beyond not clicking on something with which we're unfamiliar and having a good password, leave us with something practical that we should be doing in our day-to-day -day lives to protect ourselves. I mean, if you still have a Yahoo email account or a Roadrunner email account or a Hotmail email account or AOL, or AOL upgrade to a modern email provider, upgrade to Gmail, upgrade to Microsoft's current service, their current capability, they will protect you. Google has gotten so good at this that if they detect that a foreign adversary is targeting you, they will notify you before they notify the FBI, and they will tell you you are being targeted by a nation state. And you get that free, thanks to your ad dollars, from Google. So that would be one thing. Get a password manager. Get that little application that costs you 20 bucks a year uh, that will manage all of your passwords how many of you use the same password on more than one account? Well, you're so honest, that's like everybody. Um, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Get a password manager. It will generate these long passwords for you so you don't have to remember them and you don't have to figure out how, ma how many ups and downs and capitals and squiggles you have to have. Password manager is the solution. Uh, sort of late in the conversation, I want to attempt a defense of uh, the government. Uh, I know it's sort of been a little disparaged here, and I certainly understand why, and I probably could have said it as well. But I have uh, a number of friends who work in cybersecurity on the private side, uh, and you lauded their capabilities earlier. But they said, if you have a real passion for the industry, at the end of the day, you want to work for the NSA. And I, is that, are, are they mistaken in that belief? Like, in other words, it's my understanding that the top, top, top talent that is protecting us indeed is an American asset. Is that an accurate understanding? Yes. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the first time I went to NSA and they pulled back the curtain so I could see everything, my first reaction was, oh my God, you know, if we can do that now, someday other people will be able to do that and then we'll be in real trouble. Um, but they are a great national treasure. My second reaction when I was out there is, all of these wonderful people are going to be stolen away uh, by private industry uh, and paid four to five times what they're making. And they could be, but most of them don't go. And so I asked the, the head of NSA at the time, um, why don't they go? Don't, don't they know they could make $500,000 in New York? And he said, oh yeah, they know, they get the offers all the time. Um, a, they love their country. B, what we ask them to do is a criminal offense if you don't work for NSA. <laughs> Final question, if I may. And thank you for be being here and, and for being so gracious with your time. Right, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you. Well, well, Michael, I, I, I have to retaliate on, on behalf of the two of us. Thank you for agreeing to host. Thank you for, to do it. for the great show you have on CNN, the great you. show you have on Sirius. Uh, it, it, those of you who don't listen to it, you really should. So thank you for that. Thank you. Before we leave, the Trump record on these issues is what? Mixed. I mean... I'm a, I was a political appointee in the Obama administration. I am a dyed-in-the-wool liberal. On cybersecurity, we've seen very strong alignment with the Obama administration. 
Now that's in part because a lot of cybersecurity officials in the Bush administration signed a letter saying they would never go work for President Trump. And so President Trump was forced to take lots of career officials who used to be my colleagues and put them into political appointments. So we've got really good leadership at places like the Department of Homeland Security now, at places like the FBI. We have career officials who have been elevated. They know what they're doing. They know these issues. And they're largely continuing the same policies that we were pursuing in the Obama years. But, but, uh, the job I used to have in the White House coordinating the U.S. government's activities in cyberspace, that job has been eliminated by the Trump administration. The attempts in, uh, that the State Department diplomats were making to have international agreements uh, and arms control and uh, cyberspace, that's all been downgraded, uh, if not stopped. Um, they wrote a very good cybersecurity national strategy. Um, I know it was very good because they cut and pasted the one I wrote. Um, I don't think they're implementing much of it. Um, and Bob's, Rob's absolutely right. There are good people in government who are trying, in the FBI and NSA and DHS, and God bless them for doing that. They just don't have a lot of White House support or coordination or funding. Thank you both very, very much. Thank all of you.